welcome back i'm back you're back we're back so we are reading the original species by charles darwin this is the burns and nobles classics edition i've already done the introduction and a chunk of chapter one which is titled as chapter one part one so if you want those the they will be linked in the i button up somewhere so you can click on there and watch those and if you want to read my comments and like my thoughts on those chapters or parts you can go to my website on my blog to read those the links will be in the description box below also you can check my impossible list where i listed up all the books i want to read so yeah you can check those uh so uh i will be reading books from that list maybe i'll be reading on camera like i'm doing this one or i'll be reading it by myself and doing reviews and stuff so yeah and if you haven't yet please press the subscribe button that will encourage me to do more stuff and yeah press the bell icon to get notified and give a like or a dislike if you want or just comment what you feel about this what i'm doing and if you really like just let me know what you want to see next if you have some books uh, that is uh on the same tone same um type of my reading list my, in my impossible list if you want to add some more books let me know in the comment section below which books you want me to read next or maybe just pick one from the tbr to read this book next so that will be fun so let's get started with the reading so today we are reading on the breeds of the domestic pigeon we are starting the pigeon stuff it's page 27 i think you can see it page 27 of the chapter variation under domestication chapter one part two on the breeds of the domestic pigeon believing that it is always best to study some special group i have after deliberation taken up domestic pigeons i have kept every breed which i could purchase or obtain and have been most kindly favored with skins from several quarters of the world more especially by the honorable w elliot from india and by the honorable c murray from persia many treaties in different languages have been published on pigeons and some of them are very important as being of considerable antiquity I have associated with several eminent fanciers and have been permitted to join two of the London Pigeon Clubs. The diversity of the breeds is something astonishing. Compare the English Carrier and the short-faced Tumbler and see the wonderful differences in their beaks, entailing corresponding differences in their skulls. The Carrier, more especially the male bird, is also remarkable from the wonderful development of the carunculated skin about the head. And this is accompanied by greatly elongated eyelids, very large external orifices to the nostrils and a wide gape of mouth. The short-faced tumbler has a beak in outline almost like that of a finch, and the common tumbler has a singular and strictly inherited habit of flying at a great height in a compact flock and tumbling in the air head over heels. The runt is a bird of great size with long, massive beak and large feet. Some of the subbreeds of runts have very long necks, others very long wings and tails, others singularly short tails. The barb is allied to the carrier, but instead of a very long beak, it has a very short and very broad one. The powder has a much elongated body, wings and legs, and its enormously developed crop which it glories in inflating, may well excite astonishment and even laughter. The turbot has a very short and conical beak with a line of reversed feathers down the breast and it has the habit of continually expanding slightly the upper part of the esophagus. 
The Jacobin has the feathers so much reversed along the back of the neck that they form a hood and it has, proportionally to its size, much elongated wing and tail feathers. The trumpeter and lofter, as their names express, utter a very different coup from the other breeds. The fantail has 30 or even 40 tail feathers instead of 12 or 14, the normal number in all members of the great pigeon family. And these feathers are kept expanded and are carried so erect that in good birds the head and tail touch. The oil gland is quite aborted. Several other less distinct breeds might have been specified. In the skeletons of the several breeds, the development of the bones of the face in length and the breadth and the curvature differs enormously. The shape, as well as the breadth and the length of the ramus of the lower jaw, varies in a highly remarkable manner. The number of the caudal and sacral vertebrae vary, as does the number of the ribs, together with their relative breadth and the presence of processes. The size and shape of the apertures in the sternum are highly variable. So it is the degree of divergence and relative size of the two arms of the furcula. The proportional width of the gape of the mouth, the proportional length of the eyelids, of the orifice of the nostrils, of the tongue, not always in strict correlation with length of the beak, the size of the crop and of the upper part of the esophagus, the development and abortion of the oil gland, the number of the primary wing and caudal feathers, the relative length of wing and tail to each other and to the body, the relative length of the leg and of the feet, the number of scutli on the toes and the development of skin between the toes are all points of structure which are variable. The period at which the perfect plumage is acquired varies, as does the state of the dawn with which the nesting birds are clothed when hatched. The shape and size of the eggs vary. The manner of flight differs remarkably, as does in some breeds the voice and disposition. Lastly, in certain breeds, the males and females have come to differ to a slight degree from each other. Altogether, at least a score of pigeons might be chosen, which if shown to an ornithologist and he were told that they were wild birds, would certainly, I think, be ranked by him as well-defined species. Moreover, I do not believe that any ornithologist would place an English carrier, the short-faced tumbler, the run, the barb, powder, and fantail in the same genus. More especially, as in each of these breeds, several truly inherited subbreeds, or species as he might have called them, could be shown him. Great as the differences are between the breeds of the pigeons, I am fully convinced that the common opinions of naturalists is correct, namely that all have descended from the rock pigeon, Columbolivia including under this term several geographical races or subspecies which differ from each other in the most trifling respects. As several of the reasons which have led me to this belief are in some degree applicable in other cases. I will here briefly give them. If the several breeds are not varieties and have not proceeded from the rock pigeon, they must have descended from at least seven or eight aboriginal stocks, for it is impossible to make the present domestic breeds by the crossing of any lesser number. How, for instance, could a powder be produced by crossing two breeds unless one of the parent stock possesses the characteristic enormous crop? The supposed aboriginal stocks must all have been rock pigeons, that is, not breeding or willingly perching on trees. But besides Silvia, with its geographical subspecies, only two or three other species of rock pigeons are known, and these have not any of the characters of the domestic breeds. Hence, the supposed aboriginal stocks must either still exist in the countries where they were originally domesticated and yet be unknown to the ornithologist. And this, considering their size, habits, and remarkable characters, seem very improbable. 
or they must have become extinct in the wild state. But birds breeding on precipices and good flyers are unlikely to be exterminated and the common rock pigeon, which has the same habits with the domestic breeds, has not been exterminated even on several of the smaller British Isles or on the shores of the Mediterranean. Hence, the supposed extermination of so many species having similar habits with the rock pigeon seems to me a very rash assumption. Moreover, the several above-named domesticated breeds have been transported to all parts of the world and therefore some of them must have been carried back again into their native country. But not one has ever become wild or feral, though the dove-cut pigeon, which is the rock pigeon in a very slightly altered state has become feral in several places. Again, all recent experiences shows that it is most difficult to get any wild animal to breed freely under domestication, yet on the hypothesis of the multiple origin of our pigeons, it must be assumed that at least seven or eight species were so thoroughly domesticated in ancient times by half-civilized man as to be quite prolific under confinement. An argument, as it seems to me, of great weight and applicable in several other cases is that the above specified breeds, though agreeing generally in constitution, habits, voice, coloring, and in most parts of the structure with the wild rock pigeon, yet are certainly highly abnormal in other parts of the structure, we may look in vain throughout the whole great family of Columbidae for a beak like that of the English carrier or that of the short-faced tumbler or burp. For reversed feathers like those of the Jacobin, for a crop like that of the potter, for tail feathers like those of the fantail. Hence, it must be assumed that not only the half-civilized man succeeded in thoroughly domesticating several species, but that he intentionally or by chance picked out extraordinarily abnormal species. And further, that these very species have since all become extinct or unknown. So many strange contingency seem to me improbable in the highest degree. Some facts in regard to the coloring of pigeons well deserve consideration. The rock pigeon is of a slaty blue and has a white rump. The Indian subspecies see intermedia of Strickland having it bluish. The tail has a terminal dark bar with the bases of the outer feathers externally aged with white. The wings have two black bars. Some semi-domestic breeds and some apparently truly wild breeds have, beside the two black bars, the wings checkered with black. These several marks do not occur together in any other species of the whole family. Now, in every one of the domestic breeds, Taking thoroughly well-bred birds, all the above marks, even to the white aging of the outer tail feathers, sometimes concur perfectly developed. Moreover, when two birds belonging to two distinct breeds are crossed, neither of which is blue or has any of the above specified marks, the mongrel offsprings are very apt suddenly to acquire these characters. For instance, I crossed some uniformly white fantails with some uniformly black burbs, and they produced mottled brown and black birds. These I again crossed together and one grandchild of the pure white fantail and pure black burb was of a beautiful blue color with white rump, double black wing bar and bar and white aged tail feathers as any wild rock pigeon. We can understand these facts on the well-known principles of reversion into ancestral characters. If all the domestic breeds have descended from the rock pigeon, but if we deny this, we must make one of the two following highly improbable suppositions. Either, firstly, that all the several imagined aboriginal stocks were colored and marked like the rock pigeon, although no other existing species is thus colored and marked, so that in each separate breed there might be a tendency to revert to the very same colors and markings. Or, secondly, that each breed 
even the purest, has within a dozen or at most within a score of generations been crossed by the rock pigeon. I say within a dozen or twenty generations, for we know of no fact countenancing the belief that the child ever reverts to some one ancestor removed by a greater number of generations. In a breed which has been crossed only once with some distinct breed, the tendency to reversion to any character derived from such cross will naturally become less and less, as in each succeeding generation there will be less of the foreign blood. But when there has been no cross with a distinct breed, and there is a tendency in both parents to revert to a character which has been lost during some former generation, this tendency, for all that we can see to the contrary, may be transmitted undiminished for an indefinite number of generations. These two distinct cases are often confounded in treaties on inheritance. Lastly, the hybrids or mongols from between all the domestic breeds of pigeons are perfectly fertile. I can state this from my own observations purposely made on the most distinct breeds. Now, it is difficult, perhaps impossible, to bring forward one case of the hybrid offspring of two animals clearly distinct being themselves perfectly fertile. Some authors believed that long-continued domestication eliminates this strong tendency to sterility. From the history of the dog, I think there is some probability in this hypothesis. If applied to species closely related together, though it is unsupported by a single experiment. But to extend the hypothesis so far as to suppose that species, aboriginally as distinct as carriers, tumblers, powders, and fantails, now are, should yield offspring perfectly fertile, inter se, seems to me rash in the extreme. From these several reasons, Namely, the improbability of man having formerly got seven or eight supposed species of pigeons to breed freely under domestication, these supposed species being quite unknown in a wild state and there becoming nowhere feral, these species having very abnormal characters in certain respects, as compared with all other columbidae, though so like in most other respects to the rock pigeon. The blue color and various marks occasionally appearing in all the breeds, both when kept pure and when crossed. The mongrel offspring being perfectly fertile, from these several reasons taken together, I can feel no doubt that all our domestic breeds have descended from the Columbolivia with its geographical subspecies. In favor of this view, I may add, firstly, that C. livia, or the rock pigeon, has been found capable of domestication in Europe and in India, and that it agrees in habits and in a great number of points of structure with all the domestic breeds. Secondly, although an English carrier or short-faced tumbler differs immensely in certain characters from the rock pigeon, yet by comparing the several sub-breeds of these breeds, more especially those brought from distant countries, we can make an almost perfect series between the extremities of structure. Thirdly, those characters which are mainly distinctive of each breed, for instance, the wattle and the length of the beak of the carrier, the shortness of that of the tumbler, and the number of tail feathers in the fantail are in each breed eminently variable. And the explanation of this fact will be obvious when we come to treat of selection. Fourthly, pigeons have been washed and tended with the utmost care and loved by many people. They have been domesticated for thousands of years in several quarters of the world. The earliest known record of pigeons is in the 5th Egyptian dynasty about 3000 BC, as was pointed out to me by Professor Lepsius. But Mr. Birch informs me that pigeons are given in a bill of fare in the previous dynasty. In the time of romance, as we hear from Pliny, immense prices were given for pigeons. Quote, Nay, they are come to this pass that they can reckon up their pedigree and race. Quote, 
Pigeons were much valued by Akbar Khan in India. About the year 1600, never less than 20,000 pigeons were taken with the court. Quote, the monarchs of Iran and Turan sent him some very rare birds. Quote. And continues the courtly historian, quote, his majesty by crossing the breeds, which method was never practiced before, has improved them astonishingly. Quote, about this same period, the Dutch were as eager about pigeons as were the old Romans. The paramount importance of these considerations in explaining the immense amount of variation which pigeons have undergone will be obvious when we treat of selection. We shall then also see how it is that the breeds so often have a somewhat monstrous character. It is also a most favorable circumstance for the production of distinct breeds that male and female pigeon can easily mate it for life and thus different breeds can be kept together in the same aviary. I have discussed the probable origin of domestic pigeons at some yet quite insufficient length because when I first kept pigeons and watched the several kinds, knowing well how true they bred, I felt fully as much difficulty in believing that they could ever have descended from a common parent, as any naturalist could in coming to a similar conclusion in regard to the many species of finches or other large groups of birds in nature. One circumstance has struck me much, namely that all the breeders of the various domestic animals and the cultivators of plants with whom I have ever conversed or whose treaties I have read are firmly convinced that the several breeds of which each has attended are descended from so many aboriginal distinct species. Ask, as I have asked, a celebrated raiser of Hereford cattle, whether his cattle might not have descendant from longhorns and he will laugh you to scorn. I have never met a pigeon or poultry or duck or rabbit fancier who has not fully convinced that each main breed was descended from a distinct species. Van Mons in his treatise on pears and apples shows how utterly he disbelieves that the several sorts, for instance, a ribstone pippin or codlin apple could ever have produced from the seeds of the same tree. Innumerable other examples could be given. The explanation, I think, is simple. From long continuous study, they are strongly impressed with the difference between the several races, and though they well know that each race varies slightly, for they win their prizes by selecting such slight differences, yet they ignore all general arguments and refuses to sum up in their minds slight differences accumulated during many successive generations. May not those naturalists who, knowing far less of the laws of inheritance, then does the breeder, and knowing no more than he does of the intermediate links in the long lines of descent, yet admit that many of our domestic races have descended from the same parents. May they not learn a lesson of caution when they deride the idea of species in a state of nature being lineal descendants of other species? Selection. Let us now briefly consider the steps by which domestic races have been produced, either from one or from several allied species. Some little effect may perhaps be attributed to the direct action of their external conditions of life, and some little to habit. But he would be a bold man who would account by such agencies for the difference of a dray and race horse, a greyhound and a bloodhound, a carrier and tumbler pigeon. One of the most remarkable features in our domesticated races is that we see in them adaption, not indeed to the animal's or plant's own good, but to man's use or fancy. Some variations useful to him have probably arisen suddenly, or by one step. Many botanists, for instance, believe that the fuller's teasel with its hook, which cannot be rivaled by any mechanical contrivance, is only a variety of the wild dipsacus. 
and this amount of change may have suddenly arisen in a sibling. So it has probably been with the turnspit dog and this is known to have been the case with the Ancon sheep. But when we compare the dray horse and racehorse, the dromedary and the camel, the various breeds of sheep fitted either for cultivated land or mountain pasture. With the wool of one breed good for one purpose and that of another breed for another purpose, when we compare the many breeds of dogs, each good for men in very different ways, when we compare the game cock so pertinacious in a battle with other breeds so little quarrelsome, with everlasting layers which never desire to sit, and with the bantam so small and elegant, when we compare the host of agricultural culinary orchard and flower garden races of plants most useful to man at different season and for different purposes or so beautiful in his eyes we must i think look farther than to mere variability we cannot suppose that all the breeds were suddenly produced as perfect and as useful as we now see them indeed in the several cases we knew that this has not been their history the key is man's power of accumulative selection. Nature gives successive variations. Man adds them up in certain directions useful to him. In this sense, he may be said to make for himself useful breeds. The great power of this principle of selection is not hypothetical. It is certain that several of our eminent breeders have, even within a single lifetime, modified to a large extent some breeds of cattle and sheep. In order fully to realize what they have done, it is almost necessary to read several of the many treaties devoted to this subject and to inspect the animals. Breeders habitually speak of an animal's organization as something quite plastic, which they can model almost as they please. If I had space, I could quote numerous passages to this effect from highly component authorities. Ewart, who was probably better acquainted with the works of agriculturists than almost any other individual, and who was himself a very good judge of an animal, speaks of the principle of selection as, quote, that which enables the agriculturist not only to modify the character of his flock, but to change it altogether. It is the magician's wand by means of which he may summon into life whatever form and mold he pleases. Quote. Lord Somerville, speaking of what breeders have done for sheep, says, quote, It would seem as if, quote, it would seem as if they had chalked out upon a wall a form perfect in itself and then had given it existence quote that most skillful breeder sir john sebright used to say with respect to pigeons that quote he would produce any given feather in three years but it would take him six years to obtain head and beak quote in saxony the importance of the principle of selection in regard to merino sheep is so fully recognized that men follow it as a trade. The sheep are placed on a table and are studied like a picture by a connoisseur. This is done three times at intervals of months and the sheep are each time marked and classed so that the very best may ultimately be selected for breeding. What English breeders have actually effected is proved by the enormous prices given for animals with a good pedigree, and these have now been exported to almost every quarter of the world. The improvement is by no means generally due to crossing different breeds. All the best breeders are strongly opposed to this practice, except sometimes amongst closely allied subbreeds. And when a cross has been made, the closest selection is far more indispensable even than in ordinary cases. If selection consisted merely in separating some very distinct variety and breeding from it, the principle would be so obvious as hardly to be worth notice.
but its importance consists in the great effect produced by the accumulation in one direction. During successive generations of differences absolutely inappreciable by an uneducated eye. Differences which I, for one, have vainly attempted to appreciate. Not one man in a thousand have the accuracy of eyes and judgment sufficient to become an eminent greater. If gifted with these qualities and he studies his subject for years and devotes his lifetime to it with indomitable perseverance, he will succeed and may make great improvements. If he wants any of these qualities, he will assuredly fail. Few would readily believe in the natural capacity and years of practice prerequisite to become even a skillful pigeon fancier. The same principle are followed by horticulturists, but the variations are here often more abrupt. No one supposes that our choicest productions have been produced by a single variation from the aboriginal stock. We have proofs that this is not so in some cases, in which exact records have been kept. Thus, to give a very trifling instance, the steadily increasing size of the common gooseberry may be quoted. We see an astonishing improvement in many florists' flower when the flowers of the present day are compared with drawings made only 20 or 30 years ago. When a race of plants is only once pretty well established, the seed raisers do not pick out the best plants, but merely go over the seed beds and pull up the rows, as they call the plants that deviate from the proper standard. With animals, this kind of selection is, in fact, also followed, for hardly anyone is so careless as to allow his worst animals to breed. In regards of plants, there is another means of observing the accumulated effects of selection. Namely, by comparing the diversity of flowers in the different varieties of the same species in the flower garden. The diversity of leaves, pods, or tubers, or whatever part is valued in the kitchen garden in comparison with the flowers of some varieties and the diversity of fruits of the same species in the orchard, in comparison with the leaves and the flowers of the same set of varieties. See how different the leaves of the cabbage are and how extremely alike the flowers. How unlike the flowers of the herd sea are and how alike the leaves. How much the fruit of the different kind of gooseberries differ in size, color, shape, hairiness, and yet the flowers present very slight differences. It is not the varieties which differ largely in some one point do not differ at all in other points. It is hardly ever, perhaps never the case. The laws of correlation of growth, the importance of which should never be overlooked, will ensure some differences. But as a general rule, I cannot doubt that the continued selection of slight variations, either in the leaves, the flowers, or the fruit, will produce races differing from each other chiefly in these characters. It may be objected that the principle of selection has been reduced to methodical practice for scarcely more than three quarters of a century. It has certainly been more attended to of late years, and many treaties have been published on the subject, and the result, I may add, has been, in a corresponding degree, rapid and important. But it is very far from true that the principle is a modern discovery. I could give several references to the full acknowledgement of the importance of the principle in works of high antiquity. In rude and barbarous periods of English history, choice animals were often imported and laws were passed to prevent their exportation. The destruction of horses under a certain size was ordered, and this may be compared to the roguing of plants by nurserymen. The principle of selection I find distinctly given in an ancient Chinese encyclopedia. Explicit rules are laid down by some of the Roman classical writers. From passages in Genesis, it is clear that the color of domestic animals was at that early period attended to. Savages now sometimes cross their dogs with wild canine animals to improve the breed, and they formerly did so as 
is attested by passages in Pliny. The savages in South Africa match their drought cattle by color, as do some of the SQ marks, their team, teams of dogs. Livingstone shows how much good domestic breeds are valued by the Negroes of the interior of Africa who have not associated with Europeans. Some of these facts do not show actual selection, but they show that the breeding of domestic animals was carefully attended to in ancient times and is now attended to by the lowest savages. It would indeed have been a strange fact had attention not been paid to breeding, for the inheritance of good and bad qualities is so obvious. At the present time, eminent breeders try by methodical selection with a distinct object in view to make a new strain or subbreed, superior to anything existing in the country. But for our purpose, a kind of selection which may be called unconscious and which results from everyone trying to possess and breed from the best individual animals is more important. Thus a man who intends keeping pointers naturally tries to get as good dog as he can and afterward breeds from his own best dogs, but he has no wish or expectation of permanently altering the breed. Nevertheless, I cannot doubt that this process continued during centuries would improve and modify any breed in the same way as Bakewell, Collins, etc. By this very same process, only carried on more methodically, did greatly modify, even during their own lifetimes, the forms and qualities of their cattle. Slow and insensible changes of this kind could never be recognized unless actual measurements or careful drawings of the breeds in caution had been made long ago, which might serve as comparison. In some cases, however, unchanged or but little changed, individuals of the same breed may be found in less civilized district where the breed has been less improved. There is reason to believe that King Charles Spaniel has been unconsciously modified to a large extent since the time of that monarch. Some highly competent authorities are convinced that the setter is directly derived from the spaniel and has probably been slowly altered from it. It is known that the English pointer has been greatly changed within the last century and in this case the change has, it is believed, been chiefly affected by crosses between the foxhound, but what concerns us is that the change has been effected unconsciously and gradually and yet so effectually that though the old Spanish pointer certainly came from Spain, Mr. Borrow has not seen, as I am informed by him, any native dog in Spain like our pointer. By a similar process of selection and by careful training, the whole body of English racehorse have come to surpass in fleetness and size the parent Arab stock, so that the latter, by the regulation of the Goodwood races, are favored in the weights they carry. Lord Spencer and others have shown how the cattle of England have increased in weight and in early maturity compared with the stock formerly kept in this country. By comparing the accounts given in old pigeon treaties of carriers and tumblers with these breeds as now existing in Britain, India and Persia, we can, I think, clearly trace the stages through which they have insensibly passed and come to differ so greatly from the rock pigeon. Ewart gives an excellent illustration of the effects of a course of selection which may be considered as unconsciously followed in so far that the breeders could never have expected or even have wished to have produced the result which ensued, namely, the production of two distinct strings. The two flocks of the Leicester sheep kept by Mr. Buckley and Mr. Burgess, as Mr. Hewitt remarks, have been purely bred from the original stock of Mr. Bakewell for upwards of 50 years. There is not a suspicion existing in the mind of anyone at all, acquainted with the subject that the owner of either of them has deviated in any one instances 
from the pure blood of Mr. Bakewell's flock, and yet the differences between the sheep possessed by these two gentlemen is so great that they have the appearance of being quite different varieties. If there exist savages so barbarous as never to think of the inherited character of the offspring of their domestic animals, yet any one animal particularly useful to them for any special purpose would be carefully preserved during famines and elder accidents to which savages are so liable and such choice animals would thus generally leave more offspring than the inferior ones so that in this case there would be a kind of unconscious selection going on we see the value set on animals even by the barbarians of Tierra del Fuego and by their killing and devouring their old woman in times of dearth as of less value than their dogs. In plants, the same gradual process of improvement through the occasional preservation of the best individuals, whether or not sufficiently distinct to be ranked at their first appearance as distinct varieties, and whether or not two or more species or races have become blended together by crossing, may plainly be recognized in the increased size and beauty, which we now see in the varieties of the Hertzies, Rose, Pelargonium, Dahlia, and other plants, when compared with the older varieties or with their parent stocks. No one would ever expect to get a first-rate Hertzies or Dahlia from the seed of a wild plant. No one would expect to raise a first-rate melting pear from the seed of the wild pear, though he might succeed from a poor seedling growing wild if it had come from a garden stock. The pear, though cultivated in classical times, appears from Pliny's description to have been a fruit of very inferior quality. I have seen great surprise expressed in horticultural works at the wonderful skill of Gardner in having produced such splendid results from such poor materials. But the art, I cannot doubt, has been simple and, as far as the final result is concerned, has been followed almost unconsciously. It has consisted in always cultivating the best known variety, sowing its seeds, and when a slightly better variety has chance to appear, selecting it, and so onwards. But the gardeners of the classical period, who cultivated the best pear they could procure, never thought what splendid fruit we should eat, though we owe our excellent fruit in some small degree to their having naturally chosen and preserved the best varieties they could anywhere find. A large amount of change in our cultivated plants, thus slowly and unconsciously accumulated, explains, as I believe, the well-known fact that in a vast number of cases we cannot recognize and therefore do not know the wild parent stock of the plants which have been longest cultivated in our flower and kitchen gardens. If it has taken centuries or thousands of years to improve or modify, most of our plants up to their parent standard of usefulness to man, we can understand how it is that neither Australia, the Cape of Good Hope, or any other region inhabited by quite uncivilized man has afforded us a single plant worth culture. It is not that those countries so rich in species do not by a strange chance possess the aboriginal stocks of any useful plants, but that the native plants have not been improved by continued selection up to a standard of perfection comparable with that given to the plants in countries anciently civilized. In regard to the domestic animals kept by uncivilized man, it should not be overlooked that they almost always have to struggle for their food, at least during certain seasons. And in two countries very differently circumstanced, individuals of the same species having slightly different constitutions of structure would often succeed better in the one country than in the other and thus by a process of natural selection. As will hereafter be more fully explained, two subbreeds might be formed. These perhaps partly explain what has been remarked by some authors, namely that the varieties kept by savages have more of the characters of the species than the varieties kept in civilized countries. On the view here given, 
of the all-important part which selection by man has played, it becomes at once obvious how it is that our domestic races show adoption in their structure or in their habits to man's wants or fancies. We can, I think, further understand the frequently abnormal character of our domestic races and likewise their differences being so great in external characters and relatively so slight in internal parts or organs. Man can hardly select, or only with much difficulty, any deviation of structure excepting such as is externally visible, and indeed he rarely cares for what is internal. He can never act by selection, excepting on variation which are first given to him in some slight degree by nature. No man would ever try to make a fantail till he saw a pigeon with a tail developed in some slight degree in an unusual manner or a potter till he saw a pigeon with a crop of somewhat unusual size. And the more abnormal or unusual the character was when it first appeared, the more likely it would be to catch his attention. But to use such an expression as trying to make a fantail is, I have no doubt, in most cases, utterly incorrect. The man who first selected a pigeon with a slightly larger tail never dreamed what the descendants of that pigeon would become. Through long continued, partly unconscious and partly methodical selection. Perhaps the parent bird of all fantails had only 14 tail feathers somewhat expanded, like the present Java fantail or like the individuals of other and distinct breeds, in which as many as 17 tail feathers have been counted. Perhaps the first power pigeon did not inflate its crop much more than the turbot now does the upper part of its esophagus, a habit which is disregarded by all fancier as it is not one of the points of the breed. Nor let it be thought that some great deviation of structure would be necessary to catch the fancier's eye. He perceives extremely small differences and it is in human nature to value any novelty, however slight, in one's own position. Nor must the value which would formerly be set on any slight differences in the individuals of the same species be judged of by the value which would now be set on them after several breeds have once fairly been established. Many slight differences might and indeed do now arise amongst pigeons which are rejected as false or deviation from the standard of perfection of each breed. The common goose has not given rise to any marked varieties, hence the tholos and the common breed, which differ only in color, the most fleeting of characters, have lately been exhibited as distinct at our poultry shows. I think these views further explain what has sometimes been noticed, namely, that we know nothing about the origin or history of any of our domestic breeds. But in fact, a breed, like a dialect of a language, can hardly be said to have had a definite origin. A man preserves and breeds from an individual with some slight deviation of structure, or takes more care than usual in matching his best animals and thus improves them. And the improved individuals slowly spread in the immediate neighborhood. But as yet, they will hardly have a distinct name and from being only slightly valued, their history would be disregarded. When further improved by the same slow and gradual processes, they will spread more widely and will get recognized as something distinct and valuable, and will then probably first receive a provincial name. In semi-civilized countries, with little free communication, the spreading and knowledge of any new subbreed will be a slow process. As soon as the points of value of the new subbreeds are once fully acknowledged, the principle, as I have called it, of unconscious selection will always tend, perhaps more at one period than at another as the breed rises or falls in fashion, perhaps more in one district than in another according to the state of civilization of the inhabitants, slowly to add to the characteristic features of the breed whatever they might be. 
but the chance will be infinitely small of any record having been preserved of such slow varying and insensible changes. I must now say a few words on the circumstances, favorable or the reverse to man's power of selection. A high degree of variability is obviously favorable as freely giving the materials for selection to work on. Not that mere individual differences are not amply sufficient with extreme care to allow of the accumulation of a large amount of modification in almost any desired direction. But as variations, manifestly useful or pleasing to men appear only occasionally, the chance of their appearance will be much increased by a large number of individuals being kept. And hence, this comes to be of the highest importance to success. On this principle, Marshall has remarked, with respect to the sheep of parts of Yorkshire, that, as they generally belong to poor people and are mostly in small lots, they never can be improved. On the other hand, nursery men from raising large stocks of the same plants are generally far more successful than amateurs in getting new and valuable varieties. The keeping of a large number of individuals of a species in any country requires that the species should be placed under favorable conditions of life so as to breed freely in the country. When the individuals of any species are scanty, all the individuals, whatever their quality may be, will generally be allowed to breed and this will effectually prevent selection. But probably the most important point of all is that the animal or plant should be so highly useful to man or so much valued by him that the closest attention should be paid to even the slightest deviation in the quality or structure of each individual. Unless such attention be paid, nothing can be effected. I have seen it gravely remarked that it was most fortunate that the strawberry began to vary just when gardeners began to attend closely to this plant. No doubt the strawberry had always varied since it was cultivated, but the slight varieties had been neglected. As soon, however, the gardeners picked out individual plants with slightly larger, earlier or better fruit and raised seedlings from them and again picked out the best seedling and bred for them. Then there appeared, aided by some crossing with distant species, those many admirable varieties of the strawberry which have been raised during the last 30 or 40 years. In the case of animals with separate sexes, facility in preventing crosses is an important element of success in the formation of new races. At least in a country which is already stocked with other races. In this respect, enclosure of the land plays a part. Wandering savages or the inhabitants of open plains rarely possess more than one breed of the same species. Pigeons can be mated for life, and this is a great convenience to the fencier, for thus many races may be kept true, though mingled in the same aviary and this circumstance must have largely favored the improvement and formation of new breeds. Pigeons, I may add, can be propagated in great numbers and at a very quick rate, and inferior birds may be freely rejected as when killed they serve for food. On the other hand, cats, from their nocturnal rambling habits, cannot be matched, and although so much valued by women and children, we hardly ever see a distinct breed kept up. Such breeds, as we do sometimes see, are almost always imported from some other country, often from islands. Although I do not doubt that some domestic animals vary less than others, yet the rarity or absence of distinct breeds of the cat, the donkey, peacock, goose, and etc., may be attributed in many part to selection not having been brought into play. In cats, from the difficulty in pairing them, in donkeys, from only a few being kept by poor people and little attention paid to their breeding, in peacocks from not being very easily reared and a large stock not kept, in geese from being valuable only for two purposes, food and feathers, 
and more especially from no pleasure having been felt in the display of distinct breeds. To sum up on the origin of our domestic races of animals and plants, I believe that the conditions of life from their action on the reproductive system are so far of the highest importance as causing variability. I do not believe that variability is an inherent and necessary contingency under all circumstances with all organic beings as some authors have thought. The effects of variability are modified by various degrees of inheritance and of reversion. Variability is governed by many unknown laws, more especially by that of correlation or growth. Something may be attributed to the direct action of the conditions of life. Something must be attributed to use and disuse. The final result is thus rendered infinitely complex. In some cases, I do not doubt that the intercrossing of species, aboriginally distinct, has played an important part in the origin of our domestic productions. When in any country several domestic breeds have once been established, their occasional intercrossing, with the aid of selection, has no doubt largely aided in the formation of new subbreeds. But the importance of the crossing of varieties has, I believe, been greatly exaggerated, both in regard to animals and to those plants which are propagated by seed. In plants which are temporarily propagated by cutting buds and etc., the importance of the crossing both of distinct species and of variety is immense. For the cultivator here quite disregards the extreme variability both of hybrids and mongrels and the frequent sterility of hybrids but the cases of plants not propagated by seeds are of little importance to us, for their endurance is only temporary. Over all these causes of change, I am convinced that the accumulative action of selection, whether applied methodically and more quickly or unconsciously and more slowly, but more efficiently, is by far the predominant power. End of chapter 1, Variation under Domestication. Next is chapter 2, Variation under Nature, which will be read on the next video. Thank you for staying with me, and if you really like, please comment and subscribe. Thank you.